Alright, we return this morning to the Torah and the second book of the law. Please open your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, we are continuing to go through the Ten Commandments. And we return again today to the second table of the law, the fifth commandment. Commandment reads, verse 12, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Last time we worked through the wording of the commandment itself. The word for honor relates to the idea of weightiness. And one way to think about it is that a person in authority has a weighty responsibility. And so it is right for those under that weight, under that authority, to honor that person in their position. Honor has to do with respectful language and respectful treatment. How we speak to and about someone in a position of honor is important. Also, how we treat them directly, how we honor our relationship to them directly, is connected to this concept of honoring those in authority. And this commandment, given as a positive instruction, begins with our first relationship. All of us are born under authority, and we will spend the entirety of our lives under authority and relating to authority structures all the time. Listen, there is never a time when you will be out from under authority. The president or the king is also always under authority. Just ask Uzziah. No man is autonomous. And now, people may want to live that way and may think that they are autonomous, a law unto themselves, but that is a self-delusion. And as we read last week in Acts chapter 5, even those who are in positions of authority have a higher law that they are accountable to. And so the Lord, in His infinite wisdom, gave His law about honoring authority at the level of the ground floor. The structure of authority has various levels, but the bottom floor, the first level of human relationship to authority, is children to parents. We are born to a father and a mother who have been given your life as a stewardship responsibility. Parents are responsible for and an authority over their children. Therefore, parents set the rules. They establish the law of the house. Parents command their children and children are commanded by God to obey them. We've also talked a lot about Christian parenting recently on Sunday nights, and we've seen that parents have a responsibility before God to raise their children in the fear and instruction of the Lord with the goal of leading them to faith in Christ and to lead them in becoming good and productive citizens in the world that God has made. Paul reminds children that God has spoken to them in his word about their duty to parents. So let's pick up our study again by turning to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6. Verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, I do want to address this whole section of Scripture and to get a grip on this whole idea of what authority is. But I've, def I've defined it for us before, but I want to do it again. And I want to expand on it. Authority is the right to make a decision. And in chapter 5, verse 21, Paul says, And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Then he goes on to explain what he means by that. To be subject to someone is to be in a proper position or relationship to those in authority over you. 
To be subject to someone is to recognize who has the right to make decisions and who has the responsibility to obey the one who makes the decisions. And the first group Paul speaks to about being in proper relationship to authority is wives in verse 22. Chapter 5, verse 22. Wives to your own husbands as to the Lord. Paul doesn't even repeat the operative word. For clarity, our English translations include it because it is carrying over the general principle of be subject to from verse 21. Wives... Recognize who has the right to make the decisions in your home. Who bears the authority and be subject to them. Well, who is that? That is your husband. He is an authority over you, and you have the responsibility then to obey his decisions. So listen, right now, do not let anyone fool you. There is no such thing as being subject to authority without the responsibility of obedience. A wife's subjection includes more than obedience, but it is not less than obedience. If a person has the right to make a decision, then those under the scope of authority of that decision have the responsibility to obey. Gymnastic flips, twists, somersaults, cannot escape the ordinary meaning of being under authority. Then, husbands, in the role of leadership in the home, you are to love your wives. How? In the same way as Jesus demonstrated when he served the needs of the body, his one flesh union with his bride, the church. Husbands are not subject to their wives. They are subject to Christ, who calls husbands to follow him, and his example. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3 says, But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Then in chapter 6 of Ephesians, we're staying in the family structure. The basic building block of all societies, and we move to the children. Children are to be subject to their parents. We talked last time about God's design in the home that both fathers and mothers are in authority over the children. Both parents are to be honored equally by their children. Fathers and mothers have the right to make decisions on behalf of the children who have the responsibility then to obey their authorities. Dad is the head of the home. But that does not mean that he is to be the object of a childish scheme to undermine mom's authority. Mothers should not act like they are powerless over their children because her husband is the chief authority in the home. No, mothers use the authority that God has given you. You are in charge of your children and you are the one who makes the decisions for them and the one who governs and corrects their decisions as they grow older. But children are not to divide and conquer their parents, and dads need to be wise to any such game. Mothers are in the seat of authority, of decision-making power over the children. She is the executor of duties of, under the leadership and authority of her husband, but she has the weighty position of authority over the children equally with dad. And again, when you are subject to authority, you cannot escape the responsibility of obedience. Proof of this is further seen in verse 5. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh. A slave owes his master obedience, even though earthly masters are not our ultimate master, are they? Of course not. But it pleases God when his slaves obey their earthly human authorities. Now let's get back to verse 1, chapter 6. Paul says, Obey your parents... In the Lord. Some people have mistakenly understood this to mean children obey your Christian parents. And therefore exclude the idea of obeying ungodly parents. No, all children are born under authority with the responsibility of honoring and obeying their parents. Listen to Colossians 3 verse 20. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing. To the Lord. 
Paul is not saying only obey your parents if they are Christians. But of course the instructions from God's word are being read in the congregation and in the home. Certainly emphasizes to children in Christian homes the responsibility God has given them to obey their Christian parents. But what Paul is getting at here is the same idea he said to wives in chapter 5, verse 22, as to the Lord. It's the same idea as he gives to slaves in chapter 6, verse 7, with good will render service as to the Lord. Children, your obedience to your parents is right, and you are to see it as from God and to God. You should obey your parents because you love the Lord. You should obey your parents because God tells you it's right. Sometimes it's hard to obey your parents. Sometimes you don't want to obey your parents. But God's word reminds children that God says this is right. Children need to be reminded that this is God's will for you. And remember, boys and girls, that obeying your parents makes God happy. Colossians 3, verse 20, For this is well-pleasing to the Lord when children obey their parents. Remember the next time you are tempted to disobey mom and dad, that God's law says it is not only right to do so, but you should do it Part of your devotion to the Lord. It is your duty because God has given it to you. The commentator Barnes has a wonderful explanation of the whys of this verse. And his comments reminded me of the nature of the Trinity. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all divine persons, equal in divinity. And within the Godhead there is authority, submission, and procession. And we have to be careful when making a comparison to the family and to the Godhead. But I think we are meant to understand the divine government. And Barnes will point it out here for us in just a minute. But when you think about the headship of the Father over the Son, we are to see also the headship of the husband over the wife. They are equal in humanity, but one is head and the other is in submission. But then the Holy Spirit is said to proceed from the Father and the Son. The Spirit then carries out the will of the Father and the Son. It is not that He doesn't also possess the divine will, but that He proceeds from them and He delights to accomplish the will of God. Children proceed from the Father and the Mother, and they are to obey the will of their parents. And in the family, we see something of the image of God in our family government. And we would expect nothing less, for we are all made in God's image. And this is all God's idea. This is God's good design and order that we might also think about Him in our daily relationships. So I want to share one of Barnes' excellent points. Speaking of the importance of the authority structure in the home and children obeying their parents, he says, quote, it is important because the family government is designed to be an imitation of the government of God. The government of God is what a perfect family government would be. And to, and to accustom a child to be obedient to a parent is designed to be one method of leading him to be obedient to God. No child that is disobedient to a parent will be obedient to God. And that child that is most obedient to a father and mother will be most likely to become a Christian and an heir of heaven. And it may be observed in general that no disobedient child is virtuous, prosperous, or happy. Let me read that again. No disobedient child is virtuous, prosperous, or happy. Everyone foresees the ruin of such a child, and most of the cases of crime that lead to the penitentiary or the gallows commence by disobedience to parents. End quote. Very well said, I believe. And I think we, understand, we underestimate this ordinary means of leading our children to faith, and it's built into the design of our homes. 
Obedience to parents is the foundation stone for building an obedience to the gospel. Which is, of course, also the law of God by His grace through faith. I mentioned this before, the law to the gospel is also a form of law. We must believe. For it is all of grace. But we must believe it. Phil Johnson commented on this commandment, quote, A child who does not have to learn to honor and obey his parents will not have a fruitful relationship with anyone. He went on to say this also, quote, Don't marry someone whose relationship with their parents is characterized by rebellion or disrespect. If you do, you are practically guaranteed to have a miserable marriage. End quote. And he went on to say, quote, Honoring your father and mother is cheaper and more effective than any kind of therapy or dietary supplement. I thought that was a good one also. Our adult lives are so often shaped and tremendously affected by that foundational relationship between children and parents. You know this to be true. That is why Scripture is clear that disobedience to parents needs to be disciplined, corrected, and driven far from them. Parents, you are meant to wield the rod of discipline in order to teach your children that their disobedience to you brings pain to their life. A swat on the rear end is minuscule. It is light and momentary affliction compared to life as an adult whose foolishness and disobedience to God brings much greater pain and suffering. Learning to obey you, mom and dad, is to lead them to understand how to become obedient to God. And so parents, you are to subject your children to your authority, and you are to wield the rod of correction. Proverbs 23, verses 13 and 14. Do not hold back discipline from the child. Although you strike him with the rod, he will not die. You shall strike him with the rod and rescue his soul from shield. Proverbs 13, 24. He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. Proverbs 22, 15. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Proverbs 29, 17. Correct your son. He will give you comfort. He will also delight your soul. Now there are a lot of problems happening in our country today. That much of it can be traced back to the issues that are rooted in ungodly households. As the home goes, so goes the nation. This is no secret. Black Lives Matter openly on their website wanted to destroy the Western nuclear family and redefine what a family is. And long before BLM got its start, it is the black family that has been decimated throughout our country, and white families are hot on their heels. And the issue stems from single parent households where mom and dad never were married or where divorce is extremely prevalent. Fatherlessness has, and broken homes are the primary way that children grow up to be rebellious and destructive influences on society. By the way, because, because when a father is not present, when the authority structure of a home is divided, young women and men especially do not learn what it means to be accountable to an authority who can actually hold them accountable. And so when a young man has an encounter with the police or other authorities, and he has not been sufficiently disciplined to respect his parents, to relate properly to law and to authority, then what does he do? He has a disrespectful and unsubmissive posture. He refuses to obey a command from a police officer. He runs from accountability for his sins and crimes. He lies, he steals, he does drugs, he abuses people, and he gets violent and other authorities that God has placed in government. And while in one sense these young people are the product of delinquent parents, 
Notice the direct communication from God is to who? It's to the children. Children, you are responsible for your actions toward authority. You are called to obey. Parents, yes, are called to discipline you so that you do obey, but the absence of discipline doesn't mean you are excused for your behavior. Rebellion lies within the heart of sinners, and it is the law of God that is directed to you. Honor your father and your mother, and when that breakdown of the household happens, when that structure is missing, when that accountability is removed, then, you, then we should expect that violence and crime will increase. You should expect fornication and teen pregnancy to be prevalent. You should expect a rise in transgenderism. So much of these behaviors from young people are the actions of young people who do not have the structure of love and discipline to guide them into the way that they should go. And lo and behold, that is what is happening in our country. It is aided and abetted by evil, God-hating adults in the government, such as those in California and elsewhere, when they decriminalize theft, when they release criminals without bail, when they refuse to protect their citizens, and instead they coddle the criminals. What you get is the breakdown of society, almost as if it's the goal. And of course, that is what Satan is all about. The attack is on the household. It is on parents, the primary authority structure, with the result then that children will be unbridled, foolish, violent, and destructive. The evil desires to tear down God's good order, and he hates all of us. And then you have the church. In many churches, sin is not named or preached against. Pastors often don't shepherd with a sense of authority. The people don't honor or respect their elders. And when someone hears something they don't like and they can't handle, they grumble and complain and then they slink off to the next church or stop going to church altogether. Or in other cases, the elders don't practice church discipline. And so we have a lot of vagabond Christians who lack stability. We have youth culture that teaches young people to reject the faith and the practice of their parents. And immorality is tolerated and sometimes supported. And we are living in a day where every level of God-ordained government is being attacked, undermined, eroded, and often by those who are in positions of authority, and all of us are affected by it in some way. And we have to be a church that stands on the truth of God's law, which is the ultimate authority. We have to get back to the fundamentals. As God's people saved by grace, we have to get back to the ultimate authority of God's word. We have to get back to a basic understanding of authority and submission. And I agree with the ministries up in Moscow along with many others. We're trying to give answers and arguments for what, we, what do we do? How do we, how do we live in this world? How do we correct the future? What is the remedy for our day? What is the antidote for the poison of our time? Getting back to our roots, to the bedrock of the Christian home. Those who want to live for God and to rebuild society that recognizes and honors God, it must begin with our homes, with your home. It is rooted and it is grounded in fathers, mothers, and children who obey God by establishing order in the home. Crime, the workplace, drugs, education, the economy, government, church, transgenderism, etc. all come back to a properly ordered home and the Lordship of Jesus Christ.
times. What is God's will for our homes? How should we be ordered? Well, first it begins with the commitment of husbands and wives who stay together and who love the Lord. This is the order of things, and many of you missed out on our Sunday evening teaching series on biblical anthropology, but this is why we went in the order we did. It starts with you as an individual before God. It starts with you understanding who you are as a man and as a woman. There are other kinds. And you are made in the image of God with a purpose. Why are you here? What has God made you to do? And then we talked about the wonderful gift of God who made us for one another. He made woman for the man. The two become one flesh as they are joined in holy matrimony until death separates them and not before. And as two people dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the institution of the church that he is building and bringing people into, those people then have babies. How is that home then to be structured? Turn with me to Leviticus chapter 19. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus 19. Verse 1 says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, and say to them, You shall be whole, for I, the Lord your God, am whole. This is the message from God to all those who are in covenant with God Almighty. And you say that you want God for your God. You say that you want Jesus as your Savior. Great. Happy to have you. Now, hear the word of the Lord. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. This is a call to the disciples of God to live like God. This is a call to imitation. This is a call to be different from the world around you. This is a call to separation from the foolishness and the emptiness, the stupidity of the rest of the world. This is a high calling, not to go it alone, not to earn your salvation. This is a call from your Father who is in heaven, graciously commanding you to honor Him, to obey Him. And His commandment is not for your hurt, but out of love for you as well. To live for God is to be, then be blessed, and it is to be then happy. This is how to have the best life now. But there's a better life to come. And notice the very next verse. Every one of you shall reverence his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. I found it interesting that this command to holiness like God immediately goes to the center of the law. If you're going to be holy like God, then there are two key commandments to accomplish this. If you're going to be holy, you must reverence your mother and your father. Listen, if you blow it with regard to your first and foundational relationship with your parents, holiness is not likely in your future. This is the starting point. And so parents and children... You need to have a home that is built on a foundation of proper fear. Now that is the word used here. The New American Standard, the Christian Standard, the ESV, the NIV, all translated as, as either revere, reverence, or respect. Good words. I would argue part of the meaning, but the King James gets it the best. When you look at this word in the lexicon, it means fear. Now, I have to scroll down. I have a digital lexicon. And when you look up the word, it says fear. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff underneath it. Now, I have to 
scroll a little while before I get to other possible definitions. Because the predominant understanding of this word is to fear. And we have to be reminded that we are also called to fear the Lord. And we have to blend and balance these ideas. To fear the Lord is to have a healthy sense of being afraid of Him. It is, it is to fear. Uzziah was not in a healthy, fearful relationship with God. At the time he went into the temple. It is to fear. Not so as to run and hide. That's not the kind of fear we're talking about. But it is to fear the weightiness. The gravitas of his person. The power of his might. The fierceness of his anger. So to properly fear the Lord. Is also to love him. To fear the Lord is to want him to be pleased with you. It is to not do the things that make him angry. And brothers and sisters, we're to have homes that are built in this same manner. Children are to be taught to fear both their mother and their father. The word for fear is a wonderful word of a proper relationship to authority. It is not the fear of a wild and crazy person who may fly off the handle in a fit of uncontrolled and arbitrary rage. That is not the kind of fear that our children should have of us. It is not to be the fear of a parent who gets drunk and violent and abusive. Of course children are going to be afraid of that. That is not the kind of fear in the relationship that God designed. The children should never have to fear the wickedness of their parents. And Paul warns fathers in the New Testament not to exasperate your children. Don't be the kind of father who frustrates his children and who makes them afraid of your wild and harsh ways. But instead, the proper fear of parents should be seen in a healthy respect, reverence, and obedience. And that is one of the purposes of the rod of correction. It is to build, it is to create a proper fear of the anger and the discipline of mom and of dad. And once children learn that, that, that the last thing that they ever want to do is to disappoint mom and dad, the last thing they ever want to do is to break their hearts, then guess what? The rod is in evil. Because that is what the rod is to teach to. It is to teach a, a fear that loves. A fear that wants to please. A fear that can't stand having mom and dad disappointed with. The rod has taught them to have a proper fear, a proper respect for the authority and the weightiness of honor that their parents should be given. But especially when there is no father in the home, or when there isn't a man who acts like a father should act. Because again, you can have a man in the home and he can also be absent, can't you? That is when children are not raised with a healthy fear that leads to self-discipline and respect for authority. Because again, that can be an issue too. You can have intact families that spare the rock. And that's the case of a waste of a dad. Because that's one of the reasons you're there. It's to discipline, to lead them to a proper fear of authority. And stay for a moment on the subject of fear. Leave your finger here in Leviticus 19 for a minute, because we'll be back here quickly. Turn over with me to Romans 13. And I mentioned last week that this commandment, remember, all the Ten Commandments are exceedingly broad, as the psalmist says. And this starts us at the bottom floor, but this commandment is meant for us to have a proper sense of all of God's ordained authority. And so we go to Romans chapter 13. Verse 1, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear 
for good behavior, but for evil? Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same, for it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is it evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience. Remember what we said about subjection earlier? It means that they have the right to make certain decisions and we have the responsibility to obey. And this is a wonderful text that really highlights this concept of having a proper and a healthy fear. If you have a proper fear and a proper respect for authority, then you do not have to be afraid of the sword, then do you? If you behave well, you don't commit crimes, you don't have to fear authority because you already fear authority in the form of your subjection to it, your submission to the governing authorities. Just like you don't have to be afraid of the paddle for mom and dad if you are living in obedience and having a proper submission and respect for authority. It's that simple. And when we are walking in obedience to God, ordinarily we are not walking around afraid of the government. But the concept of fear of discipline is always there because they do, they do what? Possess the soul. It is the same thing in the home. Ordinarily you do not walk around afraid of your parents, but they do possess the rod, so you should have a healthy fear. Children should reverence, respect, and also fear their parents as demonstrated in your submission to them, your obedience to them. But what is the other God ordained sphere of government? It is the church. We have very little reverence and respect and fear in the church, and that needs to be recovered also, just like in every sphere. And that comes from both ends, as pastors don't recognize themselves as wielding the authority of Christ in the spiritual rod of discipline. And it comes from the people who have very little respect or fear of their elders. And that's something to expand on another time, but issues in every sphere are important and they're serious. And let's turn back now to Leviticus 19. Some of you didn't leave your finger there, my guy. Leviticus 19. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And then he says, Every one of you shall fear his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Stop right there. Notice that holiness moves into the law of God with regard to our human relationships and our direct relationship to God. Both tables of the law involve our holiness. And what he does here is he smashes the fifth and the fourth commandments together. And how timely for our study as well. What have we been saying over the last three plus months? The Lord cares about how you treat him and his day. And at this point here, the Lord makes the connection to all the Sabbaths, plural. God cares about our relationship to our earthly parents, and He cares about our hearts with regard to our heavenly parent. Flowing from a life that is pursuing holiness comes fearing our mother and our father and our heavenly father. And in the verses that follow, He goes from the Sabbaths to turning from idolatry. If you are going to be holy, you have to fear God by worshiping Him on His day and also worshiping Him exclusively as He prescribed. The fifth and the fourth commandments teach us about how we might live holy lives under the Lord. Now, as part of the family of God, this is a call to obedience to the law of God. And listen, if you are tempted to think, I'm sure glad I'm not a Jew in Israel at the time that this was given. I'm so glad 
So Jesus doesn't make such demands now. I'm sure glad Jesus doesn't expect holiness from me. That sounds impossible. That Old Testament is full of words like fear, laws. And I'm so glad that I'm not under the law. I'm under grace where I can just live how I want and pursue what makes me happy because Jesus died for me. I'm God's child and there is nothing I can do to be pleasing to God. Turn in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. Verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ears. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you address as Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. This is New Testament law. This is talking to those in the church who have been redeemed. They call God their father. They claim the precious blood of the lamb, the blood of Christ for themselves. And if that is you, as obedient children. Stop right there. The idea here is that you know what it means to be an obedient child. You know what it means to be under authority. You know the goodness of a child who submits to his parents. You are to be an obedient child of God. And what is the calling for God's children? Whether an Israelite standing under the cloud, the smoke, and the thunderous voice of God at Mount Sinai, or a child of God sitting in a lifetime chair in a gym in Middleton. It is like the Holy One who called you. Be holy yourselves in all your behavior. Adults and children alike, be holy, for God is holy. And notice verse 17. If you address God as Father, then you best conduct yourself with a proper sense of fear in the rest of your time here on earth. God holds the keys of life and of death and of hell. And if you think that you are a child, but that you can live however you want, and your Father in Heaven will say, oh well, there's nothing I can do. They already said the magic words, I'm stuck with this person. You may have another thing coming. That is something to be afraid of. But if you conduct yourself in proper fear, reverence, and respect for your Heavenly Father, proving to be of good and imperishable seed, then you have nothing to be afraid of. For your reverence, your respect, your fear shows itself to be properly placed in your Lord. And what I want us to all see today is how important God's design for authority is. It is rooted and it is grounded in the home. And that is where children are to be taught to fear mom and dad. Mom and dad are to train their children to not only fear them. We talked about this a little bit on Sunday night. Part of the goal of parenting is not just so that you can get what you need out of your children. But you are seeking to train them to relate to other people, to other authorities. And that training is to lead them to have a proper fear of civil authorities, of church authority. 
But it all goes back to our foundation. And for many of us, we do need to do a foundation check sometimes. We may need to acknowledge the cracks that are there, the holes, the missing parts. And we may need to do some work then to re-fortify that foundation. We may need to ask for forgiveness. We may need to do what we can to have a proper attitude and to approach authorities ourselves. Beloved, let us go back to the basics. This is how we go forward into the future. This is the answer that we have to a world that is crumbling around us. It is the Lordship of Jesus Christ over us as individuals. Then we marry together, we have babies, and we build a household that exalts Jesus Christ and His glorious design and order for us in our homes. And so let's help each other. Let's be patient with each other. Let's respect and reverence and fear God ordained authority as we fear the Lord in our pursuit of holiness unto Him. Next time, I know inquiring minds do want to know. How do we relate this commandment when authority is dishonorable? When it is weak? When it is abusive? So we look forward to being together on the subject again. Next. Our gracious God, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for its older testament and newer testament to reveal the unchanging will of God for your people. It is your will that we would live holy lives in proper fear of your ordered authority. Lord, we recognize that the world around us is crumbling in many respects because authorities are foolish and wicked. Authority is also abdicated. Our society wants to tear down the home and build up young people who do not understand you or the world that you have made and the authority structures that are for our good. So Lord, we pray that we, as your people, would have clear answers. Not just with words, but with the actions of our lives and our homes. So Lord, we pray for strong marriages. We pray for husbands and wives who individually are submitted to God, their Father. And together they are properly ordered in their relationship with each other. We pray that your word would be central, authoritative, and sufficient, not in theory, but in practice in our homes. Lord, we pray that you would be with husbands, fathers, give them strength, give them grace, give them discipline, commitment, help them to be all that you have called them to be, Submitting themselves first to the Lordship of Christ. Be with wives and mothers. Give them grace in their calling. Give them submissive and respectful spirits. Desiring to honor you, their father, as they honor their human head or husband. We pray for fathers and mothers and their parenting responsibility. Lord, we pray that you would give them grace. Give them knowledge and conviction. Give them strength for the task. Help them to be faithful representatives of you in their households. Establishing authority so that children are properly raised with the fear you call us to. We pray for children to whom this commandment is especially directed. 
that they would see what their calling is, that it pleases you when children obey their parents. Give them grace for the task, for we also know that their parents are sinners. Give them wisdom. Help them in their responsibility. And Lord, we pray that you would lead them to a knowledge of you from the earliest of ages, that they would submit themselves to God their Father and their Savior, Jesus Christ. From our homes, Father, we pray that you would build a strong and healthy church. From our homes, we pray, Lord, that you would build strong and healthy communities, cities, counties, and states, and the whole nation. For this is good for us. Your law is so kind, gracious, and loving. So Lord, we pray that you would drive these truths into our hearts, humble us, and help us to walk with you in holiness for the sake of the glory of your name.